Today we have a returning guest. Today's guest is Peter Cohen. He's CEO and founder of Great Demo. And uh, in fact, he joined us already previously on episode number 44, where we talked about how to suspend disbelief. Highly recommend it. So today we want to focus on the matter of storytelling. Sales Excellence, your podcast for software B2B sales and pre-sales. My name is Tim, and I'm a sales engineer at Seismic. And I'm Jan, pre-sales leader at SAP. Welcome to a new episode of our show. Welcome back, Peter. How are you? I am well. I'm vertical. How are you, gentlemen? <laughs> Vert vertical is good. It's not sleeping time yet. So great to have you back here with us. So storytelling, I think it's a bit of a buzzword in pre-sales, right? It's always been said, yeah, you have to tell a story, you have to tell a story. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's all over the place. And I think sometimes people maybe not entirely sure, including myself, what that actually means if, if they are being given that advice. And secondly, if they, if they do realize that it is maybe helpful to have a story as part of a certain pitch, a demonstration, whatever it is we're talking about, how to actually execute on that. So I think that's that was sort of the trigger for us to engage in this conversation, Peter, and to dig a bit deeper into what storytelling means, why it's important, and how to do it. I'm excited. Sounds good. So as a first opening point here, um, let's briefly talk about the why, right? Jan and myself, we're big fans of Simon Sinek, and he's always, uh, well, he made himself obviously famous with several TED Talks and also the book where it says, it's literally in the title, Start With Why. So why is it important to even consider storytelling when it comes to selling technology or selling software feeder? So I think the answer is, is very, very simple. Facts by themselves are inherently boring. Facts are boring. And the reason people tell stories, the reason people use stories, is to make things much more memorable and remarkable. And that's, that's actually going to be the theme of this whole session. If we look at, um, let's, let's do the following. What I'd like to ask um, one or the other of you to do is to go ahead and, and read that story that I shared uh, via email just a few minutes ago. So just go ahead and, and uh, one of you read it. All right, story starts. You are riding a bicycle rather fast. You skid on some gravel and fall, scraping your legs and arms. You're bleeding and are moderately hurt, but your bike seems to be okay. Someone sees you fall and comes offer to offer help. He offers you water, but you aren't thirsty. You are bleeding. He offers you a patch kit for your bike, but your tires are fine. You are still bleeding. Now you're not only hurt, but also irritated. He offers food, music, asthma medicine, dancing girls and guys, a new chain, a map, handlebars, bicycle bags, and a smartphone. All are very nice offers, but clearly what you need is, one, a few bandages, and two, a couple of aspirin. All right, perfect. First of all, thunderous round of applause for that impassioned reading. Everybody should be clapping. <laughs> so question, <laughs> there you go. So the question I would ask is, what is the purpose of that story? What's the moral of the takeaway message of that story? Either, either of you. I'm going to say Jan can take this one. <laughs> And I say, for me, it's just like a very friendly guy who tries to offer help, but in the completely wrong direction because he hasn't really realized what the person who falls from the bike uh, really needs in that situation, right? So that's perfect. Now, if I tell you that it's another way of looking at most demos, how would you translate that story now? Yeah, I mean, first of all, like discovery comes comes to my mind, right? So if, if I don't really understand what the other person needs or is looking for or what their like vision is to make it a little bit bigger, it would be maybe really hard to tell a good story to them and to help them understand why they should work with me or deal with me. Yeah, so this this story is actually an analogy. Uh, it's an example of how most traditional demos actually operate. They show way too much, all those things that the customer does not need, is not interested in. And what the story is, is trying to share is that what the customer really needs in this case, which is a couple of aspirin and a Band-Aid to stop the bleeding, has never been offered. 
And if you actually, and this is kind of fun, because if you go up to the top of the story, in bold is a title, and it says what? Specific capability. Yes, it's the specific capabilities a customer is looking for to solve his or her problem, not everything in your offering. And that's the moral of the story. It's the specific capabilities that somebody's looking for. So this is exactly why we tell stories, because well, I'm not going to tell you why I, I wanted to do this story at the beginning. We'll, we'll just see what happens. But the idea, the fact of specific capabilities is frankly boring. And so to make it live, to make it resonate, we wrap that idea inside a story. So that's the starting point that I wanted to use with this. The next point and reason you asked the question, why, why do we use stories, is because as humans, we are programmed to forget. We absolutely are. We are programmed to forget. In fact, have you ever gotten into your car and driven to a location that you, you go to frequently, like a, a, a grocery market or some other store? You arrive at the location and you suddenly realize what? What do you suddenly realize? That you have been thinking not about how to get there the entire time, but your thoughts were somewhere else entirely. Exactly. And you and you say to yourself, hmm, I must have been on what? You have no recollection of the drive itself. So this is what's going on in our brains. We are programmed to forget. Think about, so either of you, did you drive, have either of you driven recently anywhere? Yes. Where to? Uh, post office. Post office. Okay. What do you remember from that drive? So I really remember the whole drive. Uh, it's not a long drive. Um, and I recently changed the route how to get to the post office for a couple of reasons. So when I was starting the drive, I was like, today I need to go that way because it will make my drive more easy, uh, which is really the case. And then I remember there have been at least four like big trucks on the street with me. And I was like, how many trucks can be in that little village here? That's crazy. And then I, of course, I, I mean, I really remember how I was parking the car in, in, into the parking space, stepping into the post office and saying, you know what? I have these uh, packs and I need to send them back. Right. So like retouring them. Um, and the lady was scanning the packages and I, I got my, My confirmation, um, I don't remember so much about driving home, but it took the same way going right. home. So what you just said is perfect, because what we remember are the things that, for the most part, are remarkable or different. So our brains are programmed to very, very rapidly um, analyze and assess the inputs that we're receiving from our environment and make a binary decision, which is, is this important or not? And the huge majority of the inputs that we receive, we think, are not important. We just throw them away. So what you remembered from that drive were the things that were exceptional or remarkable or different. I chose a different route. There were four trucks in the dorf in the little, the little village, and how could it possibly fit? Those are the things that you remember. Now think about all the things that you encountered that you threw away. So, for example, all the other cars, the people, the trees, birds, plants, what was going on in the sky, all of that stuff was received by your brain, processed as not important, not threatening, not amusing, not sexually attractive. As a result, we throw it away. That's where stories come in. Stories are an element of making things remarkable and different and memorable. And that's why we want to use stories in demos, because the facts, all that, those, that parade of trees and plants and people, we process those, <clears throat> we said they're not important, and we threw them away. It's stories that take an idea like specific capabilities and make it memorable. So I think that that answers the question quite well, right? So it's basically stepping away from your generic standard demo and creating an experience that becomes memorable for our audiences, for our prospects, whoever we engage with at that time. So I think the, the obvious question then becomes, how do I make them remarkable? And uh, you've highlighted in the, in the previous alignment that we did, Peter, 
the importance of the so-called U mode. And I would love for you to to maybe elaborate a little bit on what what is behind that concept. So it's it's very simple and it's surprisingly effective. Um, U mode meaning. When you're doing a demo, most presenters will say, now I'm going to do this, I'm going to click here, I'm going to click here, I'm going to see this, I do this. It's all about what's happening for the presenter. Um, there's a middle position, which is we would see this, we would see this, and that's a little bit more uh, inclusive or inviting. But when you use you, uh, either formal or informal, depending on what culture you're in, <laughs> um, you're basically... Yeah pushing the experience to your customer, to your prospect. So you would click here, you would see this, in a moment you would receive an alert. It positions things much more directly uh, in the client's shoulders and on the client's head, if you will. Um, and it's a very simple change to make in one's demos that makes a connection with the audience that, that much more, uh, well, that much stronger, very frankly. I don't remember the, the actual studies, but I know that there are studies that have been done that have, that have proven out that the simple movement from I or we to you increases attention and retention rather dramatically. So question in between. Um, I like the concept. I think I can already feel the power of it. Uh, I also know a lot of like sales engineers using personas within their demos, right? So you say, hey, we have Tim, we have Peter, we have Maria, or, and they are in specific roles like sales representative, um, marketing uh, expert, whatever it, it would be. So is there like an easy way to incorporate the concept of personas with, with the you mode? How would you approach that? Or are you saying, forget about personas, use the you mode to really Yeah, I, get to the next level. I choose B. <laughs> Personas are just your. When you talk, when you say, uh, we've got four people that will be in this demo. We've got uh, Mary the manager. Uh, we've got you know, three other names. What you're really doing is you're filling up uh, your audience's available brain slots with useless information. So you're asking them to remember, oh, yeah, Mary's a manager. Why not simply say, Tim, as a manager, you would click here, you would see this. So you really bring the people into it as opposed to ask them to remember other useless information along the way. I would say that personas are a good step towards um, making your demos more personalized. But why not go the next step and, and use you? Uh, and I mean, f so for me, you just combine that, right? So you would be aware of your audience. You would know to whom you are talking to. And you would know, hey, Tim is in the role of a manager in that sales department of that company. Um, and you would make Tim your persona. And at the same time, you could say, hey, you as Tim, you would do this. Um, yeah, makes sense to me. You know, mm -hmm. just actually as a, as, a small, as a small anecdote, as a small story, um, I'm working with an organization that has an intake form. They do uh, loan applications. They provide a, a portal and capabilities for small businesses or individuals um, to submit loans, loan applications rather, over the web. Um, very simple idea. And, and I'm watching some of their example demos and every single time uh, the salesperson or the sales engineer, the pre-sales person, started off the demo by saying, okay, Uh, I'm going to go ahead now and play the role of a customer who's asking for an auto loan. So I'm going to type in a fictitious name. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And all the way through the intake form, the process, uh, it's the pre-sales person who's been filling out the form. Um, I did a blog post just a week ago that said, why not in bring the customer into this, <clears throat> bring the prospect in and invite the prospect to actually play the role, in this case, the persona of the client who's interested in doing the loan. So, for example, Tim, if you and I were doing this and I was in pre-sales, I'd say, Tim, tell you what, I'll type, but you give me the information. So, Tim, I'll, I'll use your first name and let's uh, make a fake last name so that you don't end up actually applying for a loan here. But, okay, what's your address? And you give me your address and I type it in. What kind of a car are you interested in? So you are really brought into this, not just in terms of use of a pronoun, but you are actually driving the demo by proxy through me. 
Mm. It ties in nicely with a previous conversation that we had uh, where we talked about suspending disbelief, right? And I, I think one of the common themes of that episode was use actual live data, right? Just to make it more tangible and make it more realistic and letting the customer fill it in with his data makes it even more realistic because then it's basically 100% relevant. So point well taken. On the U mode, I do have one additional question though. I mean, I think it, it makes a lot of sense and just when you're speaking to your user bias, so to say, you're speaking to the persona that you're actually addressing the solution um, to just use them as an example, as opposed to like Mary for marketing. So it's actionable. When I speak to a C-level suite that is potentially owning the budget, where maybe even the user bias are not present, how would you approach it then? So it's it's really the same idea. It's It's you and your team is where you go with that. So... Uh, ultimately, the C-level the C person is still responsible. He or she is setting direction, has made a strategic decision. We want to move forward with this project. It's his or her goal to make that happen, and therefore, you becomes very, very important. We're hoping that our software will enable you, Tim, as the CFO, to be able to reduce your OpEx costs by blah, 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 blah. This is all about you, and your team will be enabled to do this, the, the steps, the, the processes, the workflows that will enable you to make your objectives. So it's all about you. Fair enough. Good point. So one of the things that I think, well, I have done it in the past. I've seen other colleagues of mine do it in the past, and I still feel it's maybe not the most optimal approach, right? So we get a meeting invite It's, it's maybe a two-hour meeting, one-hour meeting, doesn't really matter. We have a certain agenda, and obviously we have done our discovery, and we're trying to compile the sort of use cases that we want to build into the demonstration. And we do it very specific. Of course, we want to be relevant. That's, that's all of it. So that, that's good. But then once we have an idea of we, what we want to show, then the task becomes, okay, how do we now make a story out of it? Right. So it's like we have these use cases, but now we want to put a story around it to exactly for the reason, as you say, uh, Peter, that we want to make it remarkable, we work it rememberable, and want to wrap it around it. Is that the best way to approach the situation? Well, I think what we really need to do is ask ourselves a question what is a story? I'm going to suggest what a story is not. So a classic, uh, classic expression that we hear asked of pre-sales doing demos is wrap a story around your demo. And the answer to that for many people is to do a day in the life. Okay. Question for you two. Is a day in the life a story? Actually, I would say yes and no, right? I mean, you're shaking your head, so you're saying no, and we discussed it before. So I say maybe. Okay. Sadly, the audience cannot see the uh, the, the faces here, but Tim was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. John was struggling with how to answer. So let me ask it slightly differently. Monday morning, you get up and you go to your home office and you go through the sequence of events of your day. Um, give me just just four or five things that you do um, after you you know you sit down at your laptop. What do you do? So I think first thing for me would be to open up the calendar, check what time of meetings I have, potentially going into CRM, just revisit the opportunities I'm currently working on, um, maybe picking up the phone, calling a close colleague to align for an upcoming meeting. Those would be typical things I would do. Okay, perfect. Now, again, the audience can't see the body language here, but as you began to talk through your sequence of steps, your day in the life, Jan began to check out. Jan looked very bored. He grew agitated. <laughs> That, that typically happens when I start talking. <laughs> that is just how so Jan really, really looks. And I, I think that is also the reason why I said maybe, right? Because like telling like a boring sequence, of course, is maybe not a story or not even like an attractive story, right? But like creating a story, how your day in the future could look like by using what we are able to offer you, I think could be a different story. It's still a day in, in, in the life. And I think for me, it's also, um, and I mean, I'm happy to have that conversation because I, I, I love like playing with it and, and addressing all these questions. So for me, it's also like 
I mean, we would never tell it that way, right? So we would always ask ourselves, let's take CRM because sure. like everyone hopefully knows what a CRM is, right? So we wouldn't go through it in, in, in that boring way, right? But we would like use the day-to-day -day business to address like the pain points we, we, we discovered like, hey, it took us a lot of time to do one, two, three, four, five, right? We struggle engaging with blah, 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 blah. So showing you the potential future of your day in a life and then also addressing all the value popping out of it at, at the end of the day, I think could be a story, right? So that's why I said maybe because like a good story, I think has at the end also to do with how you tell it, right? Um, and how do you make it relevant? So I'm going to challenge um, At least that's my impression right now. So I'll challenge you on this. What's the difference between a story and vision? So what you're describing is a vision of the future state. What's the, what the day in the life could look like when the, the solution is in place? That's a vision of the future, not a story. A story has certain elements in it that that grab your attention, that take you along the journey of the story and provide you with a, with a conclusion that remains strong in your head. Um, I think I referenced uh, Chip and Dan Heath's book, uh, Made to Stick, where he identifies certain key storytelling elements. But, but if we even leave those aside for now, think about when you were a child or you were a teenager, And somebody would say, uh, when you were a child, you'd say, mom or dad, tell me a story, okay? Now, when you said, tell me a story, what kind of anticipation, what kind of thought went through your mind? I mean, as a child, definitely basically something that they have experienced already and they would share with me, right? Or In an interesting way, hopefully. In interesting um, normally, way. I was asking my grandfather to tell me a story. Yeah, well, that's, yeah <laughs> so. but there's good stories and there's stories that are not as good. Um, or um, imagine you are you are at a, a camp out. You're um, you're with a group of other teenagers, and somebody starts to tell a story. It's dark. It's nighttime. Somebody starts to tell a story of a ghost. What happens as you're listening to that story? So, I think a good story makes the audience invested in it you start to maybe identifying with, let's say, the main character, which in a storytelling scenario would be the person that tells the story in most cases. If I'm going to the movies, then maybe it's the director or the, the screenwriter or whoever. And um, I'm, maybe I'm coming at this at a very academic angle, but I'm also thinking about there needs to be a conflict, something that needs to be overcome. And then obviously something that enables the protagonist to overcome that hurdle, that challenge, and actually come out in a better way. And that's, I think that's sort of like the blueprint for any type of Marvel, superhero, whatever type of movie uh, out there um, that uses that basic structure. And that is one classic structure of a very successful story. It's called the American hero story. Um, it's different than the French hero story, by the way, which always ends in, in tragedy. Just check it out. It's true. <laughs> but the, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> but the hero story is, is very, very successful because it describes exactly what you were just talking about. It's a 12-part story. It's well-documented. You guys can look it up online. And every single Marvel movie, Guardians of the Universe, uh, they all follow that structure. Um, and that's a story that has certain key storytelling elements. It has, as you said, it's got conflict that is faced, conflict that's resolved, new learnings, people move to a new plane of operation. Um, it's different than a vision, and it's very different than a day in the life. And that's exactly my point. Does that help, does that help with that? I, I would still argue, I mean, We have read the website and we discussed about it um, beforehand. And I mean, I personally, I love all the Marvel movies and I get what you are saying, right? So, I mean, if I pick that aspect of there need to be a conflict or maybe some pain or something the hero needs needs to overcome at some point, right? I mean, that could be the day in a life. 
So <laughs> you, you could easily make it part of the story. It could be. And that's where you can either harvest or manufacture stories around somebody's day in the life. But it has to be an exceptional day in the life, not just your every Monday morning. And that's my point behind it. So a day in the life story could be something like, well, I came in, we had just installed the new software from whoever, and this, our new CRM software, and all of a sudden I get a call from a customer saying, I have this horrible, horrible problem, I need to have it solved. Um, previously, we used to have to, to go look to paper files, we had to do this, we had to do that. I tried out this new system, and as a result, I suddenly was able to find, oh, the reason this guy's having this problem is we never provided him with the key to the API, and because I had the access to that, uh, I could provide it to him right away over the phone. He was able to get going with his application. He sent me a really nice email message that said, hey, your help was exceptional, really appreciated." That's a mini story. What I just told, and I manufactured that on the fly, is a mini story. It's not a day in the life. It's a piece of a day in the life where conflict was resolved. There might have been a twist or an element of surprise. There was a happy outcome. That's where you begin to have a story. Does that help? No. No, no I mean, that's fair, and I totally agree. That's why I said maybe. I really hope that like conversation was was helpful um, because I I would say we are definitely on the same page, right? So maybe we're arguing with like the wording a little bit, uh, but I'm I'm with you, right? So that Monday morning boring, Tim's boring Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, my boring Monday no, morning. No, 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 no worries. We don't want to make that a story, but I say it can be part of it, or it, yeah, it can maybe the issue, and then of course come up with something which. It's remarkable, memorable, and attracts me. I was going to do an example story. So when I mentioned I was I was banished to Basel, Switzerland for two years, and uh, I was supporting the European team doing tons and tons of demos uh, all over the continent and in the UK. <clears throat> We had a rep in Scandinavia, Tori Gustafsson, whose idea of the best demo meeting was to have the most people in the room for the longest possible duration. And he invited me to go to, um, to Uppsala, to Austria, before it was AstraZeneca. And uh, I fly to Uppsala the evening before the demo. And uh, I get an email message from Tori that says, for whatever reason, he won't be able to join me the evening before. He'll meet me the morning of the demo. Okay. Two small but important pieces of information. Number one, and by the way, I have no information at all so far, no discovery information on the plan for the meeting. So I walk onto the campus and I'm brought not to a meeting room, not a conference room, but I'm taken to an auditorium. And as I'm looking around, there's easily 200 people in this room. So this was software for discovery research. And I can tell right away there's every job title from discovery research, chemist, biologist, metabolism, toxicology, you name it. I still have zero information from Tori. Uh, I get myself set up, and oh, by the way, uh, element number two, the demo was scheduled to run from 8 a.m. until 12 noon, four hours, okay? I have no information from Tori on what the plan is. Still expecting, <laughs> still expecting that he will have an agenda. He shows up uh, crisply at five minutes to eight. We say good morning. At 8 a.m., he starts and says, good morning, everybody. I brought my technical expert from California, Peter Cohen. Here he is. And Tori sits down. <laughs> so now I'm looking <laughs> at 200, Jeez. yeah, 200, 250 Swedish researchers. And for those who know, they're not the most verbal people on the face of the earth. And I say, what would you like to see? Because I don't know. And they're all looking around like, well, you, you asked us here. So, The moral of the story is I invented something called the menu approach. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, on the continent was to type as I talked. And so I said, well, how many of you are interested in, and I typed on the screen, uh, chemical inventory management systems, and I got maybe 20% of the audience raising their hands. And they go, oh, no, this is terrible. 
I said, how many of you are interested in structure activity relationship tables, SAR tables? Oh, it was about 80%. And I suddenly realized what I was doing was building, if you will, a menu. And by asking relative percentages of who was interested, I ended up with a rank prioritized list of the applications we would show. So now, ask me what was the purpose for that demo meeting? What was the purpose for that demo meeting, Peter? Thank you so much. It was the, to determine the number of paid users for a pilot. And as a result of stumbling into this menu approach technique, we were able to more than double um, the number of users to from something like, I think it was originally targeted at 50 to 165, which resulted in a, a deal that was about... If I recall correctly, I think 650,000 Swiss francs, which was a pretty good pilot project at the time. So what do you do when you stumble into something that works? You do it again. You do it again. Okay, now, that is a story that is not a day in the life, although it was a day in my life, but it was an exceptional day, and I turned that experience into a story to teach people the importance and the ability to apply something called the menu approach. So it'll be very interesting to see what you take away and how well you remember that story, because that's exactly why I tell it, is to frame and, if you will, um, capture the idea of the fact of a menu enabling something to take place in a way that people remember it very, very strongly. So that's the difference between yeah. a daily life and something that is storyable, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like that approach, by the way. My question on that would be, why the hell did you go there without ah. any discovery? Tori, Tori, <laughs> that's um, for another episode. Yeah, I know. But I'll, I'll answer briefly. Tori was an exceptional person. Think about this. He managed to get, I think it was about 250 um, research scientists into a four-hour meeting. So he had some exceptional capabilities. He was terrible on doing discovery, but you know his his modus was bring them together and then let the pre-sales guys do what they do so well. Blah 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 blah. Anyway, interesting that that uh, all took place. And it seems that you had a trusted relationship with him. I did, <laughs> and a unique relationship. Yeah. All right. So, so maybe we can shift gears slightly here because I'm still now, I'm recognizing that telling stories is helping my cause of being memorable, of being remarkable, of uh, potentially increasing the probability that we at the end win a deal. Right. So, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back to my original situation I described earlier. I have this meeting set up. I don't know sometime next week. It's a one-hour meeting. We have identified out of the 50 use cases that we can help with. We have identified five that we want to pitch to this particular customers because we want to show it to them because we believe uh, this is how we will help them. But we are still on this very feature function level of of, of describing those use cases. Right. So how do I and I like what. You just said, Peter, how do I storify that now? How do I actually start putting this into a frame, maybe using the template of the American story uh, where there is like a protagonist who overcomes a challenge and then comes out more powerful at the end? Like, do I do this now five times for all of these five use cases or how do I make it? How do I do it? You could contemplate doing it five times, um, but that's rather challenging. Here's a, a sequence to contemplate. Um, You, if you present the use case, it's a series of facts. So you present the use case first as a series of facts. Um, if you want to make it a little bit more resonant or a little bit stronger in terms of memory, use an analogy or a metaphor. So you'd say, this. let's use our CRM system. Um, trying to think of a good analogy for a CRM system example. It's like having your, your fingers on every customer and their needs right at your desktop, as opposed to you know, paper files, for example. But if you really want somebody to remember it, you, this is when you offer a customer success story. And one of the ways to do this is to make it appear to be ad hoc. So let's say, let's, let's use the example of, uh, that I did before. 
somebody is saying, well, I'm not really sure I understand the value of you know, having all this information in a database. Why is that? Why is that, that so good? Oh, let me share with you. I just heard from another customer very similar to you who had just put this software into use. They were suffering from a situation where a customer had called up, was, was complaining bitterly, was said they're going to they're going to stop using the product and they're going to go to a competitor. And by because they're able to find the API key in literally in moments and provide it directly over the phone and not have to send an email later on, the customer was able to, to solve their problem. In fact, the customer wrote a very, very nice email back saying, wow, your, your service was exceptional. Uh, we're going to stay with you guys forever. Thank you so kindly for doing that. That's a customer success story, and that's how you combine to a certain degree the you mode that we talked about earlier with a story that enables the customer to say, oh, I can see myself in that kind of a situation. By the way, that's different from Marvel because very few of us actually have superhero powers. <laughs> so I just had a little bit of a light bulb moment here when you elaborated on that because um, I've been selling sales performance management solutions for a number of years. I recently switched, but I did that for a number of years. And my ability after the four years to go in front of a prospect and tell other customers success stories was much higher than in the first three, six, whatever, even in the first two years, right? Because I obviously was more exposed to more projects. I was more exposed to other colleagues and I heard those stories and so on. But it's a huge leverage, as you as you just mentioned, because being able to tell those customer success stories in an authentic and tangible way makes a huge difference. And I think there's a lesson to be learned here, even though maybe we have only been working at a company for maybe like three months, but spending a specific amount of time on customer success stories and being able, even though we maybe it wasn't our project, but maybe it was a colleague's project and we spent maybe half an hour with him or her to understand how this deal came about will enable us to tell these convincing stories in an authentic manner right at the beginning when we start out new, for example, in a new job with new technology or whatever, as opposed to having to wait four years. So let's expand on that because that's one of the points we wanted to talk about in this. Um, we, as customer-facing field people, uh, pre-sales, sales, even marketing, we are walking and sometimes talking databases of customer success stories. And Tim, what you just said about it takes time to accumulate a good set of customer success stories. This is why, as an organization, we need to actually put into place a mechanism to capture and share good stories through the organization. So it's not just a personal story that you reuse, but it's one that you can share with your colleagues. Um, this is one of the, I would say this is one of the finer and very, very uh, leverageable aspects of storytelling that most organizations never think about. It happens, um, it happens by accident. In other words, Tim, you get together with a colleague and you say, oh, I just met with so-and-so, and you tell that story. And the colleague thinks, ooh, that's a really good story. And they remember it because we are wired for stories and storytelling. Um, but the process is very, very inefficient. It's very ineffective. It's, it's happen chance, if you will. And so organizations that actually put into place a storytelling hour for people to share good stories and refine them, have the opportunity to really uh, expand their, their library of useful stories um, and take advantage of them. Most organizations have, uh, most large organizations have teams that are supposed to collect reference stories. Those are dry, they've been sanitized, they've been blessed by legal, which means they are boring, they're just a set of facts. But the way we tell stories anecdotally without mentioning any particular customer name, those have zip and zing and power because they, they still have the emotion, they still have the twists, they have the element of surprise, they've got the hero at the end. Does that, does that all resonate? Yeah, this is extremely interesting, I find. Because, I mean, I've seen the spectrum of 
I need a week to even find a customer success story wherever I'm going, maybe in the intranet or I'm speaking to people or I'm going to the customer success team in CRM and I'm taking a full week to actually find a customer success story that would resonate with the prospect I'm speaking to. So that's the one aspect. And the other one is, um, which I've also seen, is that there is a, a myriad of customer success stories, all well documented, maybe even a nice looking PowerPoint sheet with a logo and a picture and a persona quote and whatever, but they don't have the emotion. They don't have the emotion and they went through that sanitation process that you just described where it's like legal and compliant and blah, 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 but not all the great stuff that you would need to actually tell a emotional, impactful story if you stand in front of someone. So nailed it for me. Interesting one. Your description, Tim, of blah, blah, blah is exactly accurate. That's what the sanitized stories are. They are blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they are definitely blah, blah, blah. And honestly, I'm even not sure if it's really that, right? So it's by compliance and legal and, and whatever. Or if it's also like mindset, right? So how do we look at it, right? Hey, we have a reference database. It's it's already the wrong like headline, right? So, so we should have like um, a pool of great stories to share or however we call it, but story, I guess, should be, be part of it. And like if the marketing or whoever is responsible for it would look at it that way and would communicate in that way, then I think you could get much more out of it because I also know all these great like fact sheets, right? Because you see, yeah, we improve productivity by 5% um, or whatever it is, or situation before, situation after, product sport, ACV. All that stuff, interesting, but not a compelling story I can like easily share. And I totally agree, Peter. I think there is so much potential um, and so much we could leverage for the whole organization. Yeah, even incredible if I start thinking about it. That is the idea. Stories are remarkable. We are, we as humans are wired for stories. And I, I don't know the biology of this, except that we as humans have been telling stories since before we could write. I love to use an example of um, the tortoise and the hare, uh, which I think we translated. Uh, let's see if I can remember this. Hold on a second. The uh, Schildkröte und der Hase. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good That's pronunciation. Um, sorry for the, the slight uh, Swiss pronunciation there. Anyway, that story is a great example. So what is the moral? What was the takeaway message from that story? Do you guys remember the tortoise and the hare? They're doing a race, right? And right. The, the hare is like, yeah, I, I will easily win because the, the tortoise is like very slow and I don't need to care about it. I will win anyway. Uh -huh. And then in between, he's going for a nap, right? Yeah. And once he's waking up again, he, he's just realizing, oh, I lost, right? Because I was not paying attention. I was not focused. I was like overthinking my capabilities maybe stuff like that and um, like the result is totally different from what you would have expected at the very beginning so it also depends on like the circumstances all that stuff is um, is happening and even as the slower tortoise you are able to win that race right yeah so this is this is perfect because two things just came out of this number one you retold that story with high accuracy. Uh, and number two, you described, you didn't actually use the punchline, but you described it. And the, the, in English we say, slow and steady wins the race, okay? That's the moral, that's the takeaway message. Slow and steady. My son, if you simply work hard and persevere, you will do well, okay? Imagine telling a teenage son or daughter, my son or daughter, if you just work hard and persevere, you will do well. That's the fact, okay? What do you think the response will be from your, your teenage son or daughter? It doesn't resonate. But if you wrap that, that idea around a story or inside of a story that has certain key storytelling elements, well, and I know we went through this before, but how old is that story? Who first collected it? You guys remember? I think it was hundreds of years old. I don't know who collected it anymore now. Tim? Yeah, me either. But I think a couple of hundred years, yeah. Okay, you're wrong. 2,600 years ago, 
2,600 years ago, it was collected by a gentleman named Aesop. It's one of Aesop's fables. And it was verbally transmitted before Aesop actually captured it and wrote it down. So that story has been in the human story lexicon for over 2,600 years. And the important points here are number one, how long it's lived. It's a simple story. It has all of the key storytelling elements. It is a hero. It has an element of surprise. It has a good moral. It's simple. It's relevant. And what it does is it takes a boring fact and it makes that fact live for 2,600 years or more. That's why I encourage people to tell real stories in demos. Yeah, that makes it very tangible. Nice one. So we're approaching the hour and I do have two more things I want to get in there. The first one is, and probably might even be a whole episode on its own, but let's give just the, the brief answer on it if you have an opinion on it. Are stories always applicable or are there sales situations for pre-sales and sales where maybe a story is not the right way to convey a message? Are there those type of situations? You know, I'm sure there are. Um, this is the classic situational question. Um, there are cases where a CEO or a C-level person just wants the answer. They don't want a story. They just want the fact. Um, but there will also be situations where you may choose to push it. So it will be very situational. And I think um, <laughs> this goes back to a fundamental principle in demos, and that's to make it a conversation and test how deep your customer, your prospect wants to go. Um, the, I was just watching a demo yesterday where a, a person asked, uh, can it do X? And the presenter said, yes. And then what did she do immediately next? She showed it. She showed it. She not only showed it, she showed all of the different options. And, and the answer took 10 minutes. And I had to laugh because the customer at the end of this did something that I often do when I'm teaching demo workshops. The customer said, oh, so the answer was yes. You didn't have to go through all that detail. All I wanted to know was, is it possible to do X? <laughs> so it's situational. I think. Oh, that's fair. And I think the one thing we, we do have to take into account um, is that when we do incorporate stories into our pitch, um, we have to accommodate the proper time for it, right? Because doing a feature function pitch, so to say, as we call it, like a firing of a shotgun, it can be done extremely fast, so fast that it's overwhelming in, in that the audits can't even perceive everything that you're showing. But if you go the other route and want to make it remarkable and, and uh, make it stick and maybe put some emotions into it, the pace goes down in the information density, so to say. But hopefully the relevance goes way up. Exactly that. So now let's do the test. Let's do the test. So um, we went through a story at the very beginning of this. Without looking at the text, without reading the email again, um, I want to ask you, one or, or both of you, to retell the story. Well, since I read it out loud, I'm gonna I'm going to leave it to Jan again. <laughs> There was a story at the very beginning, really. But I mean, I'm always honest. So when you said, hey, there was that story at the beginning, there was a need to like push my brain to think about it. Uh, and then it came back, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the story, story was basically Tim was riding a bike. Then he had a crash and he was lying on the street and pleading. I would actually say a lot of blood there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I walked by and I said, oh, Tim. We haven't met for a long time. Can I offer you some cheesecake? <laughs> But he said, no. And I stayed friendly. I said, do you want some lemonade? He said, no. And I said, do you want to watch the latest Marvel movie with me? And he still said no. And I was, I mean, at some point I just went away because he was always saying, saying no. But he was still laying uh, on the street bleeding. You, you forgot the dancing girls and guys. But uh, <laughs> aside, aside from that, sorry about that. But I added like my personal note to it, I believe. You did. You actually told this better than I did by a long shot. But what was the takeaway message? Two things. Number one, what did Tim need? I needed bandages and aspirin. That's right. And what was the moral of the story? I mean, to, to phrase it my own words, put yeah. yourself into the shoes of the person you're engaging with. 
There you go. And this is exactly it. The fact, put yourself in the shoes, the specific capabilities, the fact of this story is very weak by itself. But the story itself lived actually quite well. In fact, you built the story up further, uh, Jan, over a period of an hour. So that is the power of storytelling. If you want somebody to remember an idea, if you want them to take away something that they will really remember from your demo, use a story. And it's got to be a story that actually has the, some of these key storytelling elements that we talked about, the hero's journey, uh, the, the Chip and Dan Heath elements. This is what makes a story. It's not a day in the life. <laughs> Perfect. And I feel like those were some great last words. And uh, I really appreciate you doing this uh, little experiment with us with the story at the beginning and allowing us to recapture at the end. And I think there were, I mean, for me anyway, a lot of light bulb moments uh, again in here in this conversation. So, Peter, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, the pleasure was mine, gentlemen. Have a terrific evening. Thanks, Peter. And I need to say, because I was waiting for that. So after 61 minutes you used terrific the first time. <laughs> <laughs> really? I, I normally get a few more of those in there. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So thank you so much. So be, before we sign out, thanks for tuning in. And we hope to welcome you once again on the Sales Excellence Podcast soon. Cheers and bye-bye. <laughs>